Lynx Outdoors here, and I have a post 3000 mile review of the Durston X Mid Pro 1. This is the first edition that came out back in the, the beginning of 2023. There is an updated version option out now on Durston's website, but this is the original. So I used this tent to through hike the Continental Divide Trail northbound this past summer in the year 2023. And I want to share how the tent held up, some of the features that I particularly liked, some areas that I thought there might be room for improvement, and also some tips and tricks about how to set this thing up and what I kind of learned after all that time in it. Let's start off with setup. It's a very easy tent to set up. It requires what I would say kind of a minimum of five stakes, though I usually used six. So the first thing you want to do is lay out the tent, paying attention to where the bathtub floor lines up, not the outside dimensions of the tent. So I intentionally laid it out sort of how I would want to be on this hill here with my head up here and my feet going down this way. But you'll notice when I laid the tent out, the body or the footprint of it is actually crooked. So it's really important to make sure that you think about the, the floor and where you want to be lying rather than the outside. So for example, this is how I would actually want this if I was going to try to sleep right here. To start out, you'll want to start with four of your stronger stakes. If you choose to have some stronger and some lighter, I used four heavy duty MSR groundhog stakes for the four corners. And then I used lighter weight stakes for the other points. You'll want to start off by making sure that all four of your guy lines are about the same length and that's to get a good pitch. So the sort of magic number I found is somewhere in the probably like the eight inch range. And it's really important that you stake this out so the guy line is pointing straight into the corner. So on the second stake here, don't pull so taut that you change the angle of the first one. Okay, so here's a tip. You wanna keep both of those guy lines on the staked side as close to 45 as possible. So what you want to do is pull the center of the tent, which just kind of has this tie-out point here, sort of towards you until you kind of give it a little wiggle and you see where it's sort of centered. So that's kind of close to being centered. And so I like to point this corner where it feels like it's in line. and stake that out like so. That's probably the most important of the, of the four stakes because this last one will line up with everything else if you just kind of give it a little jiggle like this and again, point that in the direction perfectly into the corner. Uh, another thing of note is I'm not pulling this very tight and I'm not tightening these as I put the stakes in. I'm leaving it sort of intentionally loose and get you a good pitch. So that being said, there you go. This is what it looks like with the four corners just roughly staked out quickly. So here's what you're aiming for with the corner guy lines. You want them in line with the stake, the guy line going right into that seam. And you wanna to try to get that as close as you can for all the corners. You can see there's about eight to 10 inches on those guy lines. And it is actually pretty loose still. This is not taut on purpose. So once you've got it staked out like this, the next thing you need to do is insert your trekking poles. And unlike some of the trekking pole tents out there, this one you don't start by putting the poles to a set length. So with a three-piece trekking pole like these black diamond ones that I use, I leave the bottom section here, which is technically the weaker section because it has the thinner diameter. I leave that where I normally hike, which is at the 115 marker on these poles. And I just open the top. So the next step is to open up the zipper. So here on the bottom of the tent, it's meant for the tip of your trekking pole. And what that really does is it helps anchor the bathtub floor in place, but it also gives you a really good way to make it so the zippers work truly one-handed. 
So I like to start off by getting my tip of my pole through there. And then the next step is to get the grip of the trekking pole up into the pocket. Make sure that you can see this cup and that way you don't get the mesh stuck in there like that. So at this point, you have to move the tent around a little bit, raise it up, and then do your best to try to eyeball where this needs to go to stay vertical. Press it up and then just lock that pole in place. Once you do that, it's really important to close that zipper after. You do the same exact thing for the other side. So in its simplest form, all you need is those four stakes to pull it out. However, once you have it set up to this point, it's important to go around and tighten the guy lines. And there you go, in its simplest form, it's up. It's important to go around and make sure that you do have those angles correct. And if you don't, it's worth actually taking the time to change the angles and get them correct. So that's the most basic pitch. It's important to tighten those four corners first. Then the next thing that you're going to want to do so you can open and close the zipper easily is to stake out the vestibule doors. These aren't nearly as weight bearing, so I like to use a smaller lighter stake. Uh, these are the ones that I used on my trip. They're knockoff ground, mini groundhogs. Um, they worked okay, but I think that the quality of the MSR groundhogs is so good that I'm going to replace these wannabes with the real thing. So here's an important tip for you. The way that this tent's geometry and design work, there is some strain that's put on this zipper from pulling it corner to corner. And you can actually really help take some of the pressure off of the zipper here by using this uh, guy out point here and instead of staking it straight down, if you actually come in slightly, you can alleviate some of the strain on that zipper. You don't want to be pulling it out to take it off axis. You want it to be pulling down, but you want it to be pulling to the side some. So what that did is it pulled this area right here taut, and that takes a lot of the strain off the zipper here. And do the same thing for the backside. Let's do a walk around the outside of the tent. So here's what I was talking about, trying to get that stake on an angle. That helps a lot. So there are peak vents at the top of the zippers on both sides. There's a little Velcro tab that holds it closed for really, really bad weather. And on the inside, there is a small carbon rod with some Velcro that simply connects like that. And that does a really good job with helping with ventilation because you have this big broadside here that hits the breeze and it actually forces it up into there. It gives it like a really big sort of channel. Uh, these doors work really well. So just one-handed, because of this stake being right there at the base of the zipper, it's truly a one-handed zipper, which is really nice. A tip for rolling up these vestibule flaps, you wanna take this corner and pull it directly away from that apex and start to roll, keeping it taut. And then there's a magnetic toggle right here. So by pulling it and keeping it taut, it keeps it a nice tight roll and it's less susceptible to the wind actually getting a hold of it and kind of blowing it out. Let's take a look at some of the features of this tent. So starting off is its simplicity of pitch. To get a true pitch only requires four stakes in each of the corners. However, you're probably going to want at least a fifth for the side that you plan on going in and out for the vestibule door like so. And six if you want to do that on both sides to be able to open the other side for the cross breeze. There are nice big peak vents at both sides at the top of the trekking poles. The way the inner body works is that there is a line that pulls tension on the inside of the bathtub floor to pull that out. So that doesn't actually require its own stake to, to be pulled out to give the inside shape. There are nice big mesh pockets that are right by the trekking pole. And because they're anchored 
right below the apex, those are really, really secure. You can put a lot of weight in them because it's transferring the weight to the trekking pole, not just making it sag down in the center here like a lot of the tents do when they have the pockets on the bottom of the mesh by your head or on the side. The magnetic toggles for this are very nice. The amount and the tension that you get with the magnet is very crisp and it's a, it's a really good length. Some of the other tents that I have with magnetic closures, that strap right here is a little too long and it allows this to unravel more and it has a tendency to pop undone when you don't want it to, but this one's really good. The tent is symmetrical, so this is the other side here, but it's exactly the same as the other side. You'll notice that the geometry of this tent is a little bit unorthodox, where the apex of the poles are diagonal in comparison to the outside of the tent. And that's one of the unique things about this tent that lets it have so many features for its weight. At the top of these apex points here, there are these small webbing loops that you can guide the tent out. And when you pull this in line, I'll demonstrate that, you can get a much stronger storm pitch. So one of my favorite things about the inner body of this tent is how this trekking pole tip holds the base of the floor down, which makes it so the interior zippers are truly one-handed, easy open, easy close. There are a ton of tents that advertise it being one-handed zippers, but I can tell you with, in all honesty that this is by far the closest to a true one-handed zipper open and close tent that I've ever used. Let's take a look at the inside of the tent. So at the very ends, by the head and the foot, there is condensation vents. So any condensation that forms up on the fly will run down and drip on the outside of the bathtub floor. There are two of these big pockets. There's a nice reinforced pocket for the head of your trekking pole to go on the handle. And here you get a view of the apex vent. So hopefully this helps you understand the height of the tent. So I'm sitting on the ground right now, I'm about 5'11". And there is at least about six inches um, above me at the top of the tent. So I can sit up perfectly straight and have plenty of room inside here uh, to sit around and hang out. Let me show you how I can stake this thing out to get it even more stormworthy. One thing that's absolutely critical with this tent is that you make sure that if you are going to guy it out, you do it with the vestibule doors zipped. They do play a role in keeping the tent under tension. And if you tighten everything up and you pull it really taut while this is open, you're not gonna be able to close it. And if you try it, you're gonna overstrain the zippers and you might separate the zippers, which has happened to me and I've met other people that it's happened to too. You do have to be extra careful with the zippers based on this design. This is an example of currently how taut it is, which is pretty good. But if it was going to be really windy, I'd want to stake it out and guide it out more. There are lots of guy out points. There's these ones here. So you can actually see, I put this yellow loop through the ones that I use regularly. And uh, the main reason for that was because I was oftentimes waking up during my trip when the wind came in or a storm came in. When I went to bed, it was calm. And when I woke up, it was because the tent was going nuts from the wind. So I found that I like to have this option to be able to do when I'm really groggy and sleepy and it's dark rather than trying to thread guy lines through these little loops. That being said, these loops right here are actually folded at an angle. So it creates a little flap that's really a lot easier to get a line in. The other ones, like the ones up here at the head and all along the base are uh, like a flat bend. And it's actually a lot harder to get the line through that. So what I opted doing to this tent was I modified it. So these are my little setups that I have for very fast and easy anchoring and guiding of this tent. So this is about five feet of zingit line. It's a, a woven nylonish plasticky cord that doesn't absorb any water. And these little clips are aluminum. And they're made by Dutchware, the company that does a lot of awesome hammock pro uh, products. But I found that these make the tensioning of the tent so much easier and they weigh almost nothing. Each one of these little metal things is about a gram. So you're going to get the most benefit by, by anchoring out the two exp, uh, apex points. So what I like to do for that is first get a stake out. <laughs> and 
and you have to sort of draw an invisible line in your mind between the two points and you want it to go into a straight line I take the little loop that I have on this side, put it over the stake. That just rests in the loop like so. And so what I can do with one hand, I'll pull this taut, I'll take out the slack, and it's that simple. I'll do the same thing for the other side. Okay, I've got the two apex ones guide out now and you can see that it's already noticeably more taut. Every single tent that exists is going to be most susceptible to wind hitting its broadest sides or its biggest panels. And this tent isn't any different. In this case, it's basically right here. This is the largest panel. And so it's important to be able to, to guide these out because this is going to take the wind on the most. And so what I found that I like to do for this was to actually anchor out both the top and the bottom into the direction of the wind at the same time. And I'll show you how I do that. So I kept this about 10 or so, maybe 12 foot length of cord. And I put two of the hooks on it and then just tied both ends with just a little stopper knot, just a very simple overhand knot so this can't fall off. And so what I like to do for this was to connect these two, take another stake. In this case, let's pretend that the wind is coming straight from where the camera is. So what I want to do is get this nice and far away. Get one a little bit taut. And so now we have it, so that's actually quite sturdy. That does a really good job of anchoring it directly into the wind. Once you have put out more guy lines, it's going to change the tension on the corners and you can get an even tighter pitch by tightening them up. If you pull the corners slightly towards the stake, you'll find you can take a little extra slack out on some of the corners. So here you have a really stormworthy pitch. So one thing of, of importance is that when the tent is all guyed out like this, you do have to be more careful with the zipper because it's putting more of a sideways strain on it. So you'll notice that the tent is still quite sturdy, even with that undone. But if I just let this go down, you can see that it's creating a gap here, hopefully. And so my biggest tip for that is to really take this corner and try to pull it here as you're bringing the zipper down. And that just takes a lot of the strain off of the zipper slider because that's one of the things that's most susceptible to failing, the zipper trying to pull the slider apart from itself. But even under full tension like this, with a nice stormworthy pitch, that zipper is still completely usable as long as you've set it up correctly. Here's an example of what that little hardware does. So it goes down to my stake. Those little tied loops make it so much easier to do. And these Dutch hardware clips are actually designed for that diameter cord. Taking these off couldn't be much easier. There's no knots. You could do this with mittens on. You simply pull the line out of that little tensioning groove there, comes right off. Make sure you don't lose your stakes, but that's it. Okay, so the next step is to collapse the poles. Again, I purposely leave my bottom piece in the spot that I like to hike with, and I just reduce the top part. So I open the top lock, lower the pole, and just take the pole out. While it's still in my hand, I like to take the time to put it back to the 115 that I like, because it's just getting it done, so I don't have to worry about it later. And then be sure to zip this closed. With that being done, the next thing to do is to pull the stakes. Be mindful, this tent is very, very light, so it's a good idea to leave the stakes that are upwind in the ground. 
It's not very windy right now, but what I mean by that is the wind is coming kind of this way. So I'm going to leave that corner and that corner in for last. With all the stakes removed, you want to find the two apex top points. Simply hold them up, bring them together. There's, of course, a lot of ways to do this. This is what works for me. And at this point, I like to gently lay it down. Simply fold it into thirds like that. And then I'm rolling this on my knee. So that way I'm not pressing it down into the ground in case there's any thorns or spiky things. The stuff sack is actually sized very nicely for this tent. It's not so big that it doesn't keep it compact when it's in here, but it's also big enough that it's easy to get in there. And there you go, it's that fast and simple. All right, I wanna give you some tips about the initial pitch because that's really important to get this set to set up correctly. So right now I've intentionally staked out the corners at good angles, but, but what I consider too tight. So I didn't crank them, but I pulled them and put them under some tension. So now when I go to actually pitch the tent, So here's the problem. The tent wasn't able to go up high enough from fully inserting the poles. So you end up with a really sloppy, flappy ridge line. Even if I tension up all the corners, you still have a, a flappy ridge because the tent wasn't able to go up as high as it should. Here's what the inner floor looks like if you have it too taut when you first set it up. You're going to lose a lot of the advantage of this being held down, it's not gonna be as easy with the one hand zipper because there's a lot of play. And then also the, the floor really can sag way down like so. You just don't have a, good, a really good pitch. Here's a demo of what it looks like if you leave everything really loose. So you'll notice at first glimpse, it's really sloppy. However, I knew it was going to be because I had everything overly loose. So here's the beauty of it though. What that really did was it allowed me to get the poles to the right height and then tighten it so now it's actually much stronger and you have a better overall ridge line set up. So I wanna show you the benefit of having slightly longer guy lines on the corners. Now again, it will mess up the pitch of the tent by making them longer, but this is what I like to call drying mode. So right now I've, I've made them all as long as they can be. So you would never want to pitch it like this to sleep in. You can see it looks more like the inside of a hammock than it does. But what's really nice about this is it gets a lot more of the floor off of the ground. And in this case, it's almost completely off the ground. So when the wind blows through, it can very easily get under here. And what I would sometimes do if the tent was really wet and I got to camp and I wanted to dry it, is I'd set it up like this and the wind could really blow through there and get the floor drier because it could blow underneath the tent. So besides the wear and tear, which I do consider to be just normal wear from use, especially over something as long as the Continental Divide Trail, there are a few things with the tent that aren't perfect. So. One thing of note is that because you have such a big broad side here, this side is very susceptible to the wind. If you are able to determine which direction the wind is going to come from and put the narrow ends into it, that's going to help a ton. Like every single campsite ever, proper site selection can really help, especially if you're not exposed to the wind in the first place. But sometimes you don't have that luxury. I wish there was a way to make this spot right here um, become a little bit more taut. And I just haven't been able to figure it out. No matter how tight I pitch everything out, if I use all my guy lines and cordage and really stake everything out as tight as I can get it, this spot right here is still the most susceptible to wind. 
And that also happens to be right by where your head is. So I don't have a solution for it, but that's just one thing of note is that sometimes I would wake up with this flapping right in my face. Not on it, of course, but it's the closest part of the rain fly to your head when you're lying down. So that's, that's probably my main thing um, that I can think of. So what did I really like about this tent? So first things first, the weight is amazing. It's very, very light. It's only about 17 ounces and you can get an even lighter version of it now. It packs down extremely small. The benefit of the non-DCF floor like this one is that that material is more compactable. So it ends up being even smaller when you put it inside your pack. The simplicity of the pitch is also very nice. You can get it set up with just the four stakes, although you're probably gonna want to at least do a fifth one by the vestibule zipper so that we can get in and out with ease and uh, it'll hold that in place so you can zip it closed easier. I really like the symmetry of the tent. Most of the tents in this weight range or this sort of purpose, like a, an ultralight trekking pole tent, the ones that this really competes with are things like the Z-Pax, uh, Altiplex, and, and sort of their one entrance uh, style tents, like the Hexamid, for example. Also with the new Hyperlight Mountain Gear Unbound 1, that's a very similar one too. It has one side with a door and the other side is just a big panel. Same thing like the Tarp Tent Aeon uh, Li, the lithium version of that. Same deal, it has a, a door on one side and then it's a big panel of DCF on the back. And so what you have in all of those tents that are in the same kind of weight range as this is a big wall that can get really condensation-y. And there's only so much ventilation you're going to be able to do when half of the inside of that tent is waterproof, single layer DCF. A huge benefit of this is that you can open up both doors and get a tremendously good cross breeze through there. You have very good ventilation. And this tent for a single wall tent, because of its two doors and so much mesh being on the inside, has very, very good ventilation. Hopefully, when you're going backpacking, you're not getting rained on every single night. So the majority of the nights, hopefully it's not raining, you can sleep with this with the vestibules rolled up and get a nice cross breeze, and that really does help reduce the amount of condensation in there. The only other way you can really get around that is by going with a double wall tent, but that of course adds bulk and weight. The one-handed zippers, both on the outside with this anchor right here, and also with the pole holding the, uh, the cordage down in the bottom like that, makes it so it truly is one hand open enclosure, which is, is very, very nice. The peak vents here are in a place that actually does really help them because you have such a big broadside panel that brings the breeze up into those. So the new version does have magnetic closures for the inside mesh. It also has the option you get to choose the floor material. So you can either go with this particular floor if you want to save a little bit of money and you want it to be as small as possible packing up, or you can get it in the DCF floor now too. So you actually get the option for that. I don't know for a fact, but I'm willing to guess that they probably started sewing those little loops in place on the tent. Well, we'll have to see if that's the case or not. Another incredible thing about this tent and the new version of it is that they actually lowered the price of this exact model right here. Uh, not this exact one, but what I mean by that is the one that has the nylon floor. So whereas this tent used to cost $5.99, you can now get, now that they offer the DCF floor, you can get that and spend a little bit more money, or they actually lowered the price point on the one with the nylon floor. When's the last time you've seen any company ever just take a product and lower the price by $50? So that's incredible in my opinion. The companies just don't do that. Another thing that I'm really impressed by is the level of care that I believe Durston puts into his tents and his, and his company. If you take the time to research this tent, which you're doing right now, I did a lot of it myself too, Dan Durston's commented on so many different videos on YouTube. So it, it just shows me that he actually really cares about his product and he goes around both looking for feedback and just wants to see what people have to say about it. There's not a lot of companies that are gonna be taking that kind of time to actually respond to people's questions, comments, and concerns on just all sorts of YouTube videos across the internet. So I'm really impressed by that. I think it really shows that he does care and he's getting direct feedback from these videos or at least finding issues that people are having regardless of what it is. Maybe it's the setup or, or they're doing something wrong or they have questions. So I just really like to see that. I 
I attended an online backpacking light.com online trail days and they had Dan Durston as a, as a guest speaker and he talked about the different types of DCF fabric and he explained what all the numbers and letters and things actually meant. And the energy I could get from him when he was talking about that, I could just tell that he was really into this stuff, like he really enjoyed it. And that's the kind of person and company that I really want to support because it just shows me that they care that much more. So at the end of the day, when you can get something as incredible as this tent with more options and features in its weight class than really anything else that's on the market, at the end of the day, you get to support somebody that cares and does that much for the backpacking community. And that's just a huge bonus to me. I thought of a few more features of the tent that I really liked after I was done recording that. So the first thing is because it's got the two doors and it has the, has the mesh inner doors on both sides, there's a lot less room in here that you'll be pressing against the condensation -y single wall DCF because you're oftentimes rolling over in some light. If you do hit the sides, they're mesh and not the DCF, which is a, a really nice thing because you're not rolling into the wet side like you would on a tent like this if it only had one door and the DCF sloped over you. The other thing where this really, really was nice was when it was raining when I got to camp, I could take off all of my wet things and leave them in the side of the tent that I got into, and then I could use the opposite side to cook my dinner, boil water, things like that, because there was plenty of room over there and all my wet stuff was on the other side. Uh, sometimes in the morning when I woke up and I had all my things on one vestibule side, I could open up the other side open up the mesh and then sort of eat hanging out of the tent so I didn't get crumbs on the inside, but having that <laughs> free side open made that possible, which you just couldn't do with a tent that only had one door. So how did this tent hold up after 3,000 miles of use? Well, I'll show you. So in my opinion, the worst, worst damage or wear and tear, whatever you want to call it, is here on the DCF body itself. So the fibers here have really started to separate. Maybe it'll show up a little bit better if I do like that with my buff. But you can see that there's, there's obvious separation in the fibers there. It's starting to open up with little holes. And again, this is the corner of the vestibule. It's not like it's gonna get me wet inside, but this is a very important structural part of the tent because it's one of the guy out points. So I think this will have to get patched up more for the uh, integrity of the tent. But that's like the only um, wear to the DCF fabric itself. This is the other corner. It's the same vestibule corner, but on the opposite side of the tent. Uh, those corners that are closer to the inner body aren't having any kind of separation issues whatsoever. Over here is not as, is not as bad as the other side, but you can maybe see that there's the beginnings of it. So that it either it's the way that I set it up or just the way that the tent pitches, there's more wear issues on the vestibule door corners than anywhere else. Um, but yeah, that's really the only um, wear and tear things that happened the whole trip, and I'm, I'm not unhappy with it. I think it's all reasonable. The Continental Divide Trail is very, very tough on equipment, and you're living in this thing constantly for months. So um, I don't consider any of this catastrophic, and I think wear and tear is a part of all equipment. The only wear and tear that I can physically see on the vestibule waterproof zippers is right here. Um, you can see a tiny bit of the thread, really only a stitch or two has started to kind of pull through there. It's a little bit more um, noticeable when it's when the zipper is closed. <laughs> so you can see there's just this little uh, thing here. Now, structurally speaking, that's very trivial. It's, it's way down at the bottom of the vestibule door. It doesn't really affect anything and it doesn't really make the zipper um, close any harder or anything. It's just pointing out the one small wear and tear thing. So. Overall, really good. Um, the zippers themselves, uh, it's probably the sliders, but over time they have been separating, especially if I set up the tent really tight. So um, I'm gonna have these zipper sliders replaced and then check to see how it does. But one issue I did have with the tent was 
trying to, to pull this slider down when the tent was under pressure and it, it would separate the zipper above it. And I was always nervous that it, it was gonna give me issues. Um, and of course that's not ideal, but I was always able to kind of like force the zipper back up while like holding these two things down in semi-even. And I could always get the zipper to reseat uh, itself and, and work again. But that's really like the only stitching issue the whole time, which is honestly, it's pretty, that's pretty good I, in my opinion at least. The wear and tear on the inside of the mesh doors is my own fault. Um, I wanted to have a quick closure system with these magnets um, because I don't like tying the little cords. And you can see that I did get a little bit of um, the magnets sort of rubbing each other and, and stuff. It's not critical. That's 100% my modifications, not, the, not an issue with the tent. The mesh on the inside is in great shape everywhere other than where I messed with it. <coughs> This side is the same thing. You can see there's some bunching and a little bit of wear and tear there from my magnets again, not the tent's fault. Um, I do have a very small tear here. Um, that's probably from packing it up at some point. It probably got caught on something when I was rolling it up. So that is the only damage to the screen the entire time. That's pretty great. One last thing that I forgot to shoot while I had the tent set up are these. So this is actually the first thing that I had issues with. Uh, what this is, is this is the bottom of the mesh door here where the zippers meet. And this is part of the floor and the trekking pole tip goes into here and it helps it a lot with being able to one hand open and close the doors. However, these were just, they came glued on. You can see there's like a little uh, square piece of sticker reinforcement. Um, now, to be fair, this came off when I switched over to powder baskets in the San Juans because the uh, thicker basket here put more force on this and pulled it out. But um, with these just being glued on, I had a really hard time getting it back on. This isn't the one that came off. This is a little piece of scrap uh, nylon webbing that I picked up in a hiker box and just kind of cut to size. And this is seam grip. And the material is very hard to glue back on. This is almost all the way off. And so when I when I messaged Durston about it, they said that they they do think that sewing these in place and then sealing it is better. So both sides did did come off enough that I tried to do like a seam grip repair job, but it is coming off. So that's something else that'll have to get fixed. The number one issue that I had and that a couple other people I met that used this or the two-person version of this had was with the zipper slider separating and essentially what you would have would be the zippers here would separate above the zipper slider. So this of course is the slider. So that always happened for the same reason and it was basically because the tent was pitched very very tight and then you try to force the zipper closed and it's putting too much of a sideways pull and it separates the zipper above the slider as you're coming down. I did have a little bit of the stitches right here come out. This is uh, the repair job that they did for me. So they reinforced it with a patch and put some stitching through to the zipper. The main issue that I had where the material itself was starting to kind of come apart was in the corners, specifically the corners of the vestibule. So they did this repair job for me where they put some DCF, DCF tape along the two sides here where the separation was happening. So that structurally reinforced it. That's a pretty unimportant place in terms of things getting wet because it is in the vestibule and it's at the very, very bottom. So it's not like you're gonna get dripped on or something, but for the structural integrity of the tent, it's certainly worth, worthwhile to make sure that you do have a repair on it so it doesn't get worse. There was zero issue with any pinholes or tears in the material itself. The outside of it held up really, really well, besides those little corners that were under really tight tension from the guy lines. This zipper on this side didn't have any issues whatsoever, so it didn't need any repairs. I just had the zipper slider replaced. This is the other side with the vestibule corner. The same thing, I had some separation on this long side here. Not nearly as bad on this side. 
So one other area that I did need repairs made were the bottom of the tent where the trekking pole tip goes in. So this is post repair. You can see that there's been a patch sewn in place and the loop has been sewn in place in a couple spots too. The original ones that came on here were just glued on and um, relatively early on in the trip when I switched from regular trekking pole baskets to the big powder baskets, there was putting too much strain of that basket pressing into this floor material here and it was really kind of forcing that away. So ultimately it was from from doing something not ideal that caused that issue. However, it just being glued on made it a lot weaker. So they sewed it on for me and I haven't had any issues with it since. Let me show you some of the modifications that I did to the tent and whether I think they were worthwhile or not. So the first thing that I did was I changed out the guy lines on the corners and by where the vestibule door cl closes. And I did that for a couple reasons. One, I wanted something with better visibility. So this is actually the reflective cord here. And that made it a little bit easier to see. The one thing about this tent is it comes with all black cordage and uh, it's not a big deal, but sometimes I would find that on this end, this black line there and this one here, sometimes when you pack it because they're right next to each other, you could get a, a twist or two where this might loop around this. Um, and so I just found it easier to make them more visible. The one thing that I, that's important to note is you can't just add infinite amount of cordage to this because it's going to mess up the setup of the tent. It's very specifically designed to have these a certain length and that's why it ships with them the length that they are. I intentionally made mine longer, not because it's going to help with the pitch of the tent, but it was more so if I had to get a stake in somewhere that um, everything else was set up okay, but that one corner, I'd rather a slightly imperfect pitch to be able to get a stake in and kind of be done rather than have to change everything around. So I made it a little bit longer for that. And then also I made it um, longer so I could do a fast drying setup, which I'll, I'll demonstrate for you. I replaced these shock cords ones with a yellow reflective one too, mainly just for better visibility and to help match the corners. One of the things I would highly recommend considering is adding these little loops. This little opening right here is pretty difficult to to get some cordage through there especially if it's in the middle of the night and it's really windy or raining so i found that it's so much more worthwhile to just put a little loop in here it adds virtually no weight whatsoever but that way i can anchor off of this and i don't have to deal with getting cordage in there each time and i did that for both apex points as well as the main panel guy out and i did it for the end down there too because with this tent based on this being the big wide side, the wind is most susceptible to this panel right here. So having those two there, like I demonstrated, you can do a really good job of helping prevent that from flapping around in the wind. So the other modification that I did was I really wanted magnetic closures for the inner mesh door. And I ended up going with this version. So I found these magnets that already had a hole in the center of them. And I simply tied them onto the elastic and this worked, however, you can probably see that it did damage the mesh of the tent. And of course, that's my own doing. I, I put metal inside this tent. These things like to try to stick next to each other. You can see why that was caused. And so that caused that kind of damage to the mesh there. Completely my fault. Um, I wouldn't recommend you do this exact system, but I really wanted the magnetic closure. And the reason why is it's so nice even when I'm filming with one hand, to be able to bunch everything up here. Just like so. And be able to get, kind of get in and out really easy. And then when it's time to actually close it, all I had to do was take this, pull it apart, stick it up there out of the way, and then I could really easily close it up like so. So I really wanted inner magnets, and that's what I went with. So let's go over weights really quick. So this is the repaired version of the tent with my changes, with the teeny tiny little magnets, which add some weight, and also with the changed guy line out. So on my scale, it comes out to exactly one pound, two ounces, or 510 grams, including the stuff sack.
The cordage that I used were basically two short and one long pieces of zingit. I kept them in this. I just had to bribe my dog with a treat to get the squeaky toy away from her. So I got 18 grams or just over half an ounce for this cordage and this little stuff sack. The nice thing about this is that you, this is very versatile. You don't have to only use this for the tent. This makes a great clothesline to hang up your stuff or something like that in camp. So if you go with the four groundhogs, it's about two ounces or 56 grams. But I would probably recommend if you really want to have a storm worthy kit, four big groundhogs by MSR and then four minis. These are imitations. But for the four of those, it's 38 grams or 1.3 ounces. And then I had this fun little Hilltop Packs DCF steak bag reminding me not to lose the steaks, which I didn't. I, I didn't lose a single steak the entire time. And that empty is a third of an ounce or eight grams. So for ground sheets, I did use two different ones. When I first bought this tent, the ground sheet wasn't available for it. I since was able to get it about at the halfway point. So this is the Durston one that's made for the one person, which on my scale with hopefully not anything touching on there, I get 96 grams or 3.4 ounces. This can connect to the inner body of the tent, like on the bottom of the floor. It has these little clips, so you don't have to pack it separately every time. The one thing I'll note about that, though, is when you do add this, you have to find a different way to pack up the tent because the way that I demonstrated, and I like to do it by holding up the two apex points and then folding it, the floor droops down, but this droops down even more. So I had to kind of play around with finding a different way when this was installed. But that's not necessarily bad. It's nice that you can leave this attached, but you'll have to figure something out. And what I used for the first half before I was able to get my hands on that is this is a Z-Pax ground sheet that's actually the duplex size. And that comes in on my scale at 3.2 ounces. So overall, in conclusion, what do I think of this tent? I personally believe that there isn't a lighter tent that has nearly as many features and benefits as the XMID Pro. It is tiny can pack down even smaller if you had to. And it's very simple to set up. There's just the four corner stakes and then the two more. But I don't think there is a single tent that can really compete with this in terms of how small and light it is and how many features it has. The trekking poles being out of the way of the doors, the true one-handed zippers for both the inner body and the rain fly, uh, the simplicity of the pitch, just doing the four corners and raising the two poles up. There are so many things I really liked about the tent. The inside was very spacious. The two vestibules allowed me to get a really good cross breeze through when the majority of the nights it wasn't raining. So you just don't have as many condensation issues with a tent that has that much mesh that can open up the rain fly compared to a lot of the other tents that sort of compete with this. So would I recommend this tent? Absolutely, definitely. Um, I have a lot of tents, a lot of trek and pull tents. I have some freestanding tents. And if I was going to leave to do the same trail again tomorrow, I would bring this model with me. The only thing I would prefer is the new version that has become available since at the time that I bought this. I personally really would like to have the DCF floor in here and the magnetic toggle on the inside. And then I'm not sure if they started sewing the trekking pole loops that go on the floor in place or not, but that's the only other thing I can really think of. I want to Shout out a huge thank you to Durston for doing the repairs on this tent. I offered to cover shipping and to pay them for the repairs, but they were kind enough to take care of that stuff for me. I have no sponsorship or affiliation with Durston. I just think really highly of, of the tent and the customer service. So if you're on the fence about getting this or not, I really think that there aren't other tents that can really compete with it for its weight, pack down size, and features. I hope this has been helpful. Hopefully I gave you a good idea of how this held up for me and the wear and tear and, and the features of the tent. If you have any other questions, leave them in the comments below. If you want, you can check out my original deep dive initial impressions of this tent. 
and uh, I'll link the video for that in the description. Thanks so much for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. There's the squeaky alligator. <laughs>